All right, Ling Tool, when we're back for another round of syntax. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about ambiguity as well as phrase structure in syntax. And just to give you a heads up, I hope I got this up. Yep. So before this lecture, what you should do is quick write number 20, uh, which asks, asks you to um, decide whether these each of these six different sentences is grammatical or not. And then if you can, uh, it's a little tricky. If you can, try to explain why the ungrammatical ones are ungrammatical and vice versa. Um, so give that a shot uh, and we'll kind of get to sort of the answer by the end of the lecture today. Um, if not, we'll talk about it at the uh, beginning of the next one. Um, so to inspire you for the beginning of this syntax lecture, uh, I've got this quote from Gertrude Stein who said that, Apparently, she said once upon a time that I really do not know that anything has ever been more exciting than diagramming sentences. Um, and as you can see, um, she looks uh, positively thrilled about the idea. Uh, so Gertrude Stein was an interesting uh, character. She was a writer back in the early 20th century, among other things. She also said in reference to the city of Oakland, California, that there is no there there, uh, which I kind of like. Um, I also... Uh, kind of like the experience of diagramming sentences. That happened when I was in um, junior high, uh, when I was like in seventh and eighth grade, we learned how to do that. But I know a lot of uh, younger students these days never get that experience in English class, which is a bit of a shame, but um, that's what we're gonna wind up doing with syntax. Uh, so if you haven't done it before, here's your chance. Uh, and if you liked it before, then great, because uh, we're gonna do a lot of it. Uh, so anyways, quick review, what are we talking about with syntax? Uh, so syntax is the study of how words are put together to form sentences and phrases. Uh, so words don't just function as individual units. They combine together to form higher level structures. We um, create sentences or produce sentences and understand them. Uh, the rules for doing that operate on lexical categories independently of the meaning of the words. So when I talk about the meaning of the words, I'm talking about what we call semantics. <clears throat> That'll be our last unit um, in the class. But before we get to that, we'll talk about syntax, which is just... Uh, just kind of describes how the words get put in various orders in uh, and higher level structures in a sentence without respect to their meaning. Um, so lexical categories, um, in order to operate in these rules, they can't be defined by their meaning. They have to uh, be defined by sort of what's relevant to um, the order or the structure of the sentences. So lexical categories we can define in terms of their syntactic distribution um, and also the types of inflectional affixes which may attach to them. I'm not going to walk you through those again um, this time, but you can refer to the previous lecture notes or lecture if you want to um, review what the different lexical categories are, but they're things like nouns, verbs, adjectives, prepositions, and so on. Um, and these lexical categories were what were used to make the old Mad Libs game work. And hopefully you did the previous quick write because um, it's supposed to be kind of fun, but also kind of confusing. Um, and also it's just always fun to play Mad Libs. So uh, these are Mad Libs I had from a previous class to kind of just demonstrate to you the point of that whole exercise. So these uh, are Mad Libs that are kind of the, the goal of Mad Libs, which is to create unexpected sentences using words in the appropriate lexical categories. So uh, this person had, in some countries, you can lie by pulling a beautiful consciousness with your testimony, um, which is maybe something that could work in a poem. Why not? Uh, this person had, in some countries, you can swim by pulling a beautiful dolphin with your box. Um, people like the adjective beautiful, I guess. and uh, if you have a beautiful dolphin, why? That's even better. Um, these were quick rides that didn't work, and we'll compare them to the previous ones to find out why. So um, this person had, in some countries, you can funny by pulling a dog's go with your celery. So that's kind of funny, but more importantly, it's ungrammatical. Uh, why is it ungrammatical? Because um, I'm putting an adjective in this syntactic frame, for one. Uh, it's coming after one of these auxiliary verbs, like can. You're supposed to have a verb here, which is what we had on the previous uh, example. So can is followed by a verb. That works. Here we have verb, adjective, noun, noun. In this case, we have adjective, noun, verb, noun. Uh, so pulling a dogs. Uh, yeah, so that works after determiner, but it doesn't work with uh, a verb right after that. So a dogs go. Uh, no, you kind of would, it would work better if there's an adjective here and a noun there. Uh, another example of something that doesn't work. In some countries, you can lovely by pulling a phone dance with your train. Yeah, this is starting to get into word sal uh, salad territory. I've got one other uh, with this particular bad syntax. In some countries, you can slime me by pulling a baseball crouch with your cactus. And I like this just because um, 
talked about a baseball crouch, uh, which this is, I guess, a verb, but could be a noun as well. And what do you know, today was supposed to be opening day in the baseball season. We're gonna miss it. Um, but I thought it's appropriate to throw in there because I like baseball. Uh, I like cactuses too. Anyways, in other countries, people sit a doctor by placing a massive box next to a tow truck. Um, this is one that was kind of structured to be grammatical, but really doesn't work out. Um, so you can't really sit a doctor. You can do other things. You can, I don't know, touch a doctor or congratulate a doctor. I guess we all should in this um, current situation we're in. Uh, or thank a doctor, maybe it would be better. Um, but anyways, uh, you can't really sit a doctor. This is a special kind of verb. It's called intransitive. They can't really be followed by a noun. We'll talk about these more as we go, uh, but it's kind of being ungrammatical in a slightly different way than say this um, structure of this sentence is being ungrammatical. Okay, that's kind of for fun, but also kind of for educational purposes. Uh, get back to where we were last time. So we were looking at this um, this poem, Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. Uh, Twas brillig in the slithy toves, did gyre and gimble in the wave, while mimsy were the borogoves and the mome raths outgrabe. Uh, and we can figure out just on the basis of kind of the distributional evidence and the uh, inflectional affixes that attach to these words, what lexical category they have. Um, sometimes it's not absolutely 100% certain what's going on. So uh, I've had discussions in previous classes about twas brillig, what exactly is brillig? Because um, different kinds of words can fit into this frame. It was raining, it was sunny, it was whatever. Um, a variety of different lexical categories can fit in there. Um, maybe even a noun, uh, an adjective, or a verb. It so happens that in the book itself, Through the Looking Glass, uh, Lewis Carroll actually goes into some detail about what he thinks this is supposed to mean. Um, yeah, so Humpty Dumpty, I guess, is the one giving this uh, poem to Alice. Uh, and he specifies that it's supposed to be four in the afternoon. That's what it's supposed to mean. Um, and then also, yeah, it really means four o'clock in the afternoon, the time when you begin broiling things for dinner. Um, so there's a bit, I guess, sound symbolism or connection there too. Uh, Lewis Carroll loved blends. Um, he called them portmanteaus, uh, which some people call them as well um, in modern English. So he has the word slithy. Well, slithy means lithe and slimy, so on and so forth. Uh, so yeah, you can read that book. It's great. It'll make you forget about all the bad news in the world for about two hours uh, and also make you think about linguistics which is great but the point of this is that in this particular syntactic frame we can't really pin down one individual lexical category um, to identify the word brillig as uh, so there is a bit of ambiguity going on here and if it weren't for Lewis Carroll's definition we wouldn't have some sort of authority to say well it's definitely this or that um, so today uh, part of what we want to learn how to be able to represent um, is the different interpretations of an ambiguous sentence or phrase in syntax. Uh, so we looked at that earlier with morphology. We're going to be able to do it with syntax as well, and that's one of the reasons why we're drawing um, tree or tree structures for sentences is to specify how the different words fit together into units that build up to the entire whole. Okay, so how do we put words together into grammatical sentences? A really simple way, or the simple-minded way you might think of, is to just put one word category after another. And let's say uh, we wrote a rule um, where we had, say, a sentence. And I'm going to draw this arrow. The arrow means it may consist of. So the sentence may consist of a determiner, followed by a noun, followed by a verb, followed by a determiner, followed by a noun. And that might get us a sentence like, the child found a puppy. Um, you can simplify this a little bit. You can get rid of this stuff, um, say, uh, or and the determiner at the start and say noun, verb, and like he cried or something like that would be a sentence by itself. Um, it turns, here's, I'll give you another example here um, with um, sort of these nonsense words from the, the poem like determiner, adjective, noun, verb, preposition, determiner, noun, the slightly toves gimbled in the wave. That works as a sentence. You could, in theory, structure it like this or say that we have a syntactic rule like this, but you actually need a little bit more than that, it turns out, because these syntactic rules can only capture patterns of words. Um, they can't capture the patterns of patterns that we know uh, is part of our knowledge of language. Okay, so I'll give you some um, examples of why we need to worry about more than just the linear order of the words in a sentence. Uh, so you can normally in class, I would 
um, stop after each of these sentences and ask you what's going on in each one of them. I think I will just kind of lay them out there uh, and maybe pause the video so you can think about them. But the first one is we need more intelligent leaders, don't we, in this particular day and age? What does that mean? Number two, I like green eggs and ham. Classic Dr. Seuss rather than Lewis Carroll. That sentence always kind of drove me up the wall when I was a kid. Not only just because I didn't like eggs in particular and was a picky eater, but because it has some ambiguity in it. Number three, the police shot the terrorists with rifles. What does that mean? Okay, uh, like I said, I am going to pause here, I think, uh, to not make this video too long. So you can think about that for a second. Uh, come up with the answers in your head, and then we'll come back to it um, in the next video.